This is the first of three lectures on Jacques Derrida's Spectres of Marx. Um, the first lecture we'll deal with address his reading of Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and Last Man. Um, and it will be followed by lectures on Derrida's reading of Hamlet uh, from Shakespeare and then his deconstruction of Marx. So these are three different aspects of this text. Uh, and we'll start with his reading of Fukuyama. As you can see there in the image, there's a picture of uh, Hegel on the far left and uh, Marx in the center. And then Kojev, who was a Alexander Kojev, who was a uh, prominent professor and interpreter of uh, Hegel, who taught in the University of Paris and had an enormous influence on a uh, generation of French intellectuals that included Derrida, but that also he uh, posthumously had an influence on Francis Fukuyama on his reading of Hegel. And uh, we're going to see Der one of the things that Derrida is going to criticize about Fukuyama's uh, appropriation of Kojev is that he was kind of, he's kind of a latecomer uh, to the discourse uh, about Hegel that was inaugurated by Kojev and that was so heavily debated for a generation or so of, uh, of, of French intellectuals uh, and 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 but was was a kind of a nuanced reading of Hegel that was often ironic and witty but that but that becomes something else in uh, in the reading of Hegel at the hands of Fukuyama which is going to be somewhat mystifying to Derrida particularly given the fact that um, you know that that uh, that that Fukuyama was was his text the end of history which when which he constructs this what he calls this artifact or what i think what derrida calls an artifact this or he kind of i think fukuyama calls it a syncretic creation of what he's going to call a uh, hegel kojeb is a kind of a create a creature of, of fukuyama's own making which he could have also called uh uh plato hegel kojeb because his his hegel is a very metaphysical platonic hegel um in any case Derrida is responding to this because the text was so uh, widely discussed at the time that the that the Specters of Marx, uh, you know, lecture was given at the University of California Riverside in 1993, following the fall of the Soviet Union, the Berlin Wall, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and then not long afterwards, uh, apartheid's uh, uh, the the end of apartheid. And, and Derrida dedicates uh, Spectres of Marx to Chris Hani, who was a member of the African National Congress. And so it's the, the, the politics of, of apartheid are in, in the backdrop of, of, this, uh, of this reading of Marx as well for Derrida. So, uh, but we're going to look and see what Derrida does with Fukuyama and, uh, and, what, and, what, and what it implies about their, the differences in, in opinion and, and this question of, you know, the extent to which, say, deconstruction is maybe construed as Marxian. Um, so, but we, we won't directly address the question of the deconstruction of Marx until the third uh, lecture. Um, so um, let's, let's put this in historical context. Um, so uh, the, 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 the talk that Derrida gave happened in 1993. The, the English language version of the Spe of Spectres of Marx was published in 1994. I believe the French version came out in 1993. Uh, but uh, what's going on at the time is you could say, well, in between 1988 and 1991, this is the period when Mikhail Gorbachev headed the USSR and inaugurated what's called Perestroika, which is Stroika, which was a, uh, a kind of a transformation that was beginning to take place. In, uh, in the Soviet Union, which finally led to the disillusion of uh, the dissolving of the Soviet Union in 1991. Gorbachev was trying to initiate reforms, but finally there was a kind of an impatience with the reforms that he was uh, introducing and, uh, and it led to the fall of the Soviet Union. In 1989, that's the, that's the year when the Berlin Wall came down and East Germany and West Germany were therein reunited and uh, this was also not coincidentally the period of the time when Ronald Reagan served as U.S. president from 1981 to 1989. And he, along with Pope John Paul II, were instrumental in, in putting pressure on, uh, on, on, the, on the Marxist world, on the Soviet world, 
and uh, this was at the time, you know, Reagan was, uh, you know, he used a lot of really problematic rhetoric to calling the Soviet Union the evil empire and so on. It was followed up by George W. Bush in his turn, spoke of the axis of evil. This is kind of the demonizing of one's uh, political opponent, very this kind of disturbing political rhetoric. But that that was in the context of, of what was happening, let's say, in the United States, while uh, all, while while the the, the the so-called second world uh, was was uh, beginning to uh, fall apart, um, as you can see, uh, Soviet Union dissolved 1991. Apartheid ends in 1992. In 1993, shortly before Derrida gives his talk, Chris Hani of the ANC was assassinated. And again, as I said, Derrida is going to dedicate uh, his talk at the Specters of Marx conference to Chris Hani. Um, the president of, uh, the, of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, served from 1991 to 1999. Those that were alive in that era might remember uh, uh, this image of Yeltsin standing on top of a car and rallying the, the crowd to, to uh, fight. And he, he ended up you know, serving for some time after, in the post-Soviet era. Okay, so in 1993, Bernd Magnus, who you see there on the left, he, he passed away not long ago. He was a scholar, a prominent scholar of Nietzsche at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, and Stephen Kohlenberg, who's a Marxist economist on the right. Uh, the two of them organized this conference from, from the uh, Center, of Global, uh, Center of Global Ideas and Society at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, and, and the conference was held in 1993 in the spring of 1993. And, and the feeling at the time, and, and I was fortunate enough to have attended this conference, but the, the feeling at the time was, uh, you know, it was one of, well, what, you know, the, the title kind of sums it up, wither Marxism, what what now, you know, what, what what's gonna happen now that the, all of this has changed? The whole world seemed to have, you know, uh, suddenly changed overnight. And I, I can still remember at the time, I. I, I graduated from UC Riverside in 1992, and I did my dissertation on uh, the Marxist uh, uh, literary theorist Frederick Jameson. I remember going to a faculty party, and, and, I, and a faculty member from, uh, I think he was a medievalist, asked me, you know, well, what, what are you doing your dissertation on? I said, Frederick Jameson. He made some laughing comment like, well, that's like, isn't that fiddling while Rome burns? I mean, that, that was kind of the feeling was that, well, um, you know, the world has, has really changed. But in, in the midst of this, um, you had uh, figures like Fukuyama who were, try, who, who were celebrating the, the, um, the fall of the Soviet Union as this, this new the feeling was, is a, you know, George Bush I, the father of George W., called, you know, this new world order. There was, there was the, the whole world was going was to change now. We had left a kind of a... Henry, what Henry, Henry Kissinger liked to talk about is a kind of a bipolar world where there was a, where there were these two uh, enormous powers, and now you had this one uh, power, and and uh, you know this one really central hegemonic power. China has not was not quite as powerful then as it is now, and uh, there there was a real feeling of triumphant, uh, a kind of a triumphant liberal uh, marketplace and liberal democracy, and so Fukuyama's book became. Uh, the, the 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 centerpiece uh, for that, and he became sort of the theorist of 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 this new world order and this triumphant end of history, which he proclaimed. And uh, well, it was you know this was before nine eleven. We've seen a lot of uh, it's it's ironic now. Here we are in the coronavirus and post nine eleven years and uh, post Iraq war, although still problems in Syria and Middle East and Afghanistan war is still going on. Doesn't seem history has has ended, and and, and of course Fukuyama has, has has to be fair to Fukuyama, he's revised his view as well. But I, I like his book because I think it's clearly written, and it it really encapsulates a kind of a thinking of an era. So if you want to kind of get get into the mindset of this era, it's a good place to to, to go. And uh, and and Derrida was responding to that, and he felt you know compelled to respond. Uh, to, to, uh, and, and he was invited to be the keynote speaker of this conference to, to give, uh, you know, and to, and, to, and to ask this question, well, what now? What, what, what will Marxism be now, now that uh, the Soviet Union has fallen? Now, we, we should note, let, let me say here, um, before we get into lo looking at some of the passages from these texts, is that, 
the context of this was that, you know, all through the uh, 80s and, and even in the 90s, and I can remember this, you know, very clearly when I was in graduate school and when people were debating this question, you know, this, remember at this time, deconstruction in Derrida was associated with, um, you know, with, with fascism in the eyes of many, with, or with, with certainly with conservatism. And now there were a few figures like Spivak, Gayatri Spivak, who were, who were working towards articulating a politicized, uh, a, a political thinking of deconstruction that would be more, you know, leftward. Uh, but, uh, but, but, the, but the common feeling was that deconstruction was, was, was conservative, if not fascist. Many, many felt that way. And this, is, this was compounded by the, um, by the Paul Devon uh, controversy, at, uh, who was Derrida's colleague at, when Derrida was at Yale. Uh, who, 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 after his death, was found to have written this this, uh, this journalist, this anti-Semitic Semitic journalism when he was young, living in Belgium during World War II, which was you know, just terrible stuff. Uh, and so, um, so here, here, you know, so, so the feeling like some Marxist thinkers were, why, why are we inviting Derrida at all? You know, uh, was kind of the feeling that some of them had. Uh, because Derrida, you know, was like he's what is he, he? He's never spoken on Marxism, and many criticized him for his silence uh, about this. And so you'll find in in the text him talking about a kind of being a kind of a Johnny come lightly, like like well, well, dude, you're you're a day late and a dollar short. You know, now you show up finally talking about Marx. That was kind of the feeling. But so his 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 intervention had this this uh, this effect of sort of saying, well, you know, now he's going to talk on something that he hadn't spoken about and had been criticized for years for avoiding. Uh, and so now he's suddenly going to talk about it. So it had, it had a feeling of a kind of momentous moment. And he raised many provocative questions, but he also placed Fukuyama and his end of history at the very center of this talk. And so this is what we're going to look at, you know, today in this lecture. OK, so you can see here. There's Fukuyama on the left, born in 1952. His book, End of History and the Last Man, came out in 1992. Uh, and uh, I think, though, that the, 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 the more, the, the one that, that, before it was a book, it was a, a, a journal article that received a lot of attention. I think that came out in 91. Uh, Derrida uh, lived from, 2000, uh, from 1930 to 2004. Spectres of Marx was published in 1994, and for, for students of deconstruction, scholars of Derrida, inter, people interested in literary theory, um, this is a, this marked a kind of a turning point where his work went from this uh, intervention, where his work went from being, you know, more uh, you know theoretical, dealing with questions of language, to becoming a, a matter of a more what some people call it the ethical turn. We could think of it as a political turn, a change, a transformation. That took place, and it was this was the moment that was it, that it uh, that really for in the eyes of many where this happened. Okay, so okay, so uh, but what we're going to see, let's let's um, let's let, uh, let before we get look into the text, let me just say this. I'll say very briefly. Um, so um, what we're going to see is that you know Fukuyama's Hegelianism is a very you know uh, logocentric Christianized you know articulation of Hegel. Now Hegel is thought can be um, I think in many ways unproblematic he read as, as, as Christian anyway, and many people are interested in Hegel precisely for that reason. Um, but uh, Derrida, remember, Derrida is not Christian. He's Jewish. Much of his thinking is influenced, uh, com, you know, comes out of very different, you know, traditions than that of, of Hegel. He, he did write a book on Hegel called Gloss, and, 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 and this is one of the, th the things that he takes on in Hegel's thought is this kind of Trinitarian uh, uh, Christian logocentrism that it seems to be implied by his thought, although Hegel, you know, claims that he's sort of, that he's not interested in uh, man in a state of nature and, and articulating a metaphysical concept of man. Uh, it, it, you know, it, I don't want to get into that, that complicated debate, uh, but, but Derrida had been thinking through these, these questions, you know, for many years prior to um, the, the appearance of this text. And so, so not surprisingly, one of the things that he's going to say about Fukuyama's uh, Hegel is that Fukuyama's Hegel is a very Christian Hegel, very uh, uh, logo, fallow logocentric Christian Hegel. And, and so he's, and, and, and Derrida is going to pick up right on this. And it's also, as we're going to see, his, his Fukuyama's rhetoric is, is littered with cliches um, figures of speech 
uh, that it, you know idioms that, that Derrida is going to uh, fix his gaze upon um, that, that recur throughout the text. Now, if we think of you know a specter and a spirit or the ghost, you know hauntology, what we're calling hauntology, what Derrida calls hauntology, we can say that, we can say that discourses are haunted by certain you know figures. And so it's not then coincidental in Derrida's reading that the figures uh, that there are figures in Fukuyama's discourse that are that, that appear to be kind of haunted and they and they come from a particular religious tradition. That religious tradition is a Christian tradition. So the rhetoric of Fukuyama is going to be, you know, it's going to herald a new gospel, a good news is going to speak of, you know, the promised land as well. Derrida is going to focus right in on these things. But let's let's see. Let's uh, see what. Derrida says about uh, hey, Fukuyama. Uh, so I say Fukuyama's last, what Fukuyama calls his last man is, is Derrida is going to say a last Christian man. I put Christian in brackets there. All right, here's Derrida. Is not what we have here in Fukuyama's The End of History and the Last Man a new gospel, the noisiest, the most uh, mediatized, the most successful, uh, when he puts successful on quotes, because uh, he means successful in a journalistic sense. Remember, Derrida was very critical of journalists. One on the subject of the death of Marxism as the end of history. Why a gospel? Why would the formula here be neo-testamentary, like a New Testament? Uh, Fukuyama believes he can, uh, he can assert, as of, this is 1993, and this is good news, a dated news, uh, liberal democracy remains the only coherent political aspiration that spans different regions and cultures across the globe. Um, this evangelical figure in Fukuyama's book is remarkably uh, consistent. Okay, so now in, in a previous lecture, we discussed how, um, you know, Marx and Hegel and Kant are all proposed sort of tele, they're, they're all progressive thinkers and they propose tele teleologies or, or in, they, they, they discuss in places where the conflict that is history may at some point come to a resolution. I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but the point is, is that, that, the, that the end, that the end, where history is going for Hegel and Marx is a different place. For Marx, it's moving towards a socialist or communist mode of production. For uh, Hegel, you know, it's moving towards a world where every, you know, like and this is in Kant as well, where every country in the world has a, is you know a liberal democracy with the Republican constitution, and so you know that I'm, this is again a vulgarization of Fukuyama's argument, but uh, but Marx and Hegel, um, you know, he that he the Fukuyama makes his choice between these two thinkers and says at the end of the day it looks like Hegel won, Marx lost, you know, he he was wrong and Hegel was right, and that that's what he's uh, suggesting here. Okay. All right. The model of the liberal state, uh, Derrida says, to which Fukuyama explicitly lays claim is not only that of Hegel, the Hegel of the struggle for recognition, it is that of a Hegel who privileges the Christian vision. And Hegel does privilege a Christian vision, as let's say, as a, compared to Judaism and Islam. If the existence of the state is the coming of God into the world, as one reads in Hegel's phenomenology of spirit invoked by Fukuyama, this coming has the sense of a Christian event. The, this end of history is essentially a Christian eschatology, like end times, Christian end times. Uh, and this is, again, why it's a, uh, it's a kind of a messianism as opposed to what Derrida is going to call a messianicity. It is in the name of a Christian interpretation of the struggle for recognition and thus the exemplary European community that the author of the end of history and the last man or Christian man criticizes Marx. Okay, so he, uh, I've already mentioned in previous lectures this idea of what Derrida calls global Latinization. And so he's going to say, look, Fukuyama is, is you know, whether whatever his religious beliefs, his rhetoric, his discourse is Christian through and through. His end of history is Christian. And he's speaking in the name of a particular culture, which is claiming itself to be universal, but it's a very particular culture. Now, if you're a Jewish uh, man from North Africa like Derrida, I grew up in a Judeo-Muslim world, uh, you know, and, and as an African world, uh, this this looks uh, th this indeed looks very you know sort of Eurocentric. This kind of view that Fukuyama is promoting, but not only that, it's it's an unproblematized logocentric, philologocentric Christianity. So it's not it's a Christianity which has not uh, thought much about you know its own metaphysical grounds. 
Okay. In truth, the whole book is inscribed in the unexamined axiomatics of the simplified and highly Christianized outline of Hegel's master slave dialectic and the phenomenology of spirit. The measure of all things has a single name, the transhistorical and natural criteria against which Fukuyama ultimately proposes to everything uh, to measure everything is called man as man. Now, now this this natural man, you know, that he's talking about. So again, let, let me re repeat this again. This transhistorical and natural criteria. You know, again, there, there's there's a there's a there's a metaphysical, logocentric man at the heart of Fukuyama's uh, thinking of you know of man. That 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 really is not. Uh, it's not, it's not really, I mean, Hegel, it's not really even Hegel that we're talking about here. It's, it's Fukuyama's construction of Hegel in logocentric terms. And so he's going to call this, uh, this, what, this is what Fukuyama calls this new syncretic philosopher named Hegel Koje. So this, this is a creation of, uh, uh, one of the Derrida's points is that Fukuyama creates this thing that he calls Hegel Koje, which is really a, plat a platono, platonic uh, logocentric, phallo-logocentric, uh, entity that really doesn't do justice either to Hegel or Kojev, e you know, either one in the way that he's reading these thinkers. Okay, so um, let, let me let me make though the, the Derrida's argument is, you know, you got to be, you know, it's not things are not as 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 clear as they appear, and you have to kind of look very carefully at the language. We're going to get a little more deeper into this, but let me, I'll show you an example of this by looking at two kind of ref quotes that we can sort of reflect on Derrida's thinking. Um, that where he seems to be saying things are they're at odds with one another. He says, for instance, inspectors of Marx, if the reference to Hegel dominates this book, Fukuyama's book, that reference is never bothered by the obvious fact that Hegel is not a philosopher of natural and transhistorical man. Now that would be that would be a, a, a claim that let's say if you're Frederick Jameson, you probably wouldn't have too much trouble with because the Hegelian Marxist view that Marxism is um, indeed not a metaphysics, but has succeeded and broken from metaphysics, like in that sense in which, you know, Marx is going to say in his thesis on the philosophy of history that the point is not to reflect upon the real, but to change the world, not to reflect on the nature of the real, the, uh, the world, but to change the world. That's, you know, Marxian praxis that 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 for Hegelian, you know, more let's say traditional Hegelian Marxists like Frederick Jameson, it, you know, Hegel is not uh, a philosopher of natural and transhistorical man. He is indeed a post, uh, you know, he is a post metaphysical thinker. Uh, but but Derrida in other places clearly criticizes Hegel for being precisely what what uh, what what he's saying here that Hegel, uh, you know, is not. And that is, for instance, he says, here's a quote from Politics of Friendship. Derrida says, undoubtedly, the subjectivity of, you know, I add in here the Kantian, Hegelian, Marxian subject never decides anything. A theory on the subject is incapable of accounting for the slightest decision. Well, that's, that's an interesting, th something that's interesting to reflect upon in terms of thinking about the decision itself. For instance, as, as a pre discussed in a previous lecture, when we looked at this question in, uh, with relation to Carl Schmidt. Um, but I, you know, I, there's another in an interview once Derrida said um, the concept of the subject is inter, uh, uh, the concept of perception is interdependent with the concept of the subject. And he said, I don't believe that there is any perception. All right. So, um, you know, the in, in, in the in the Heideggerian, let's say, reading of Hegel, Kant, Marx, the subject object dialectic, as, as discussed in a previous lecture, this, the subject is the rational subject is always predicated on a metaphysical ground, and I don't think that there. I mean, there's there's the the, the Derrida's reading of Hegel doesn't contradict Heidegger at all in that uh, regard, and so he but he's simply alerting us to the fact. I think he's what he's doing here in the in the quote above is he's alerting us to the fact that 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 Fuki, there's there's that Fukuyama's construction of a logocentric Hegel. Is is really oblivious to, um, to 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 the the complexities and subtleties of Hegel's argument, which say someone like Jameson would be affirming in terms of in, in terms of thinking of this question with respect to metaphysics. Okay, so one one question that I think is we need to ask here um, is Derrida's critique of Fukuyama fair? Um, and I I pulled out some quotes here. 
um, because it's it's um, you know the rhetoric. This is I, I don't know. There are places in, in Derrida's rhetoric that I think they're, are kind of problematic. You know, because he, t- he adopts a very sort of um, he kind of looks down his nose at, at Fukuyama. I'm like I'm older. Some he was some twenty years older. He read Kojev years ago, and I think he sees he sees this as a kind of a a, a bizarre. Uh, book written by a novice, and Fukuyama was pretty young when he wrote it. Uh, but he, but Derrida's rhetoric is very. Uh, he adopts a very uh, critical tone. But let's let's we'll, we'll read his uh, language itself. He says Fukuyama's book remains essentially in the tradition of Leo Strauss, re, uh, relied on by Adam Bloom, uh, the grammar school exercise of a young, industrious but come lately reader of Kojev and a few others. Although one must uh, admit that here or there, this book goes beyond nuance and is sometimes suspensive to the point of indecision. Kind of a qualified uh, uh, praise. Uh, And he says another point, one should not be unfair to this book, Derrida says. Although such works remain fascinating, their very incoherence and sometimes distressing, distressing primitivity play the role of symptomatic signal. Okay, so um yeah so he's um you know he's very critical he says which which one must account for so now here now here i'm going to read another passage this is this is when he, now derrida quotes from kojev who unlike fukuyama he 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 has uh, he doesn't totally agree with his reading of hegel but he has great uh, respect for kojev he says who could deny that the neo-marxian and para-heideggerian reading of hegel's phenomenology of spirit by kojev is interesting it played a formative, not negligible role uh, from many standpoints for a certain generation of French intellectuals just before or after uh, the war. So, uh, yeah, Derrida finds, uh, you know, uh, Kojev to be fascinating, uh, but he's he, he doesn't think that the, the, that the appropriation of Kojev that we find in Fukuyama's End of his, History and Last Man really does justice to Kojev, certainly not to Hegel. Okay, so I've, I'm, I've pulled out here a few passages from Fukuyama is what I'm calling here the Platonic Christian Hegelian man. And then we just look, you know, there, there's, there are many others, but these are just a few instances that you can sort of see what, what, what Derrida is talking about. Um, here's one passage where he says, Thymos, again, remember the part of the, 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 part of the soul that is, desires recognition. Um, as it emerges in the Republic constitutes something like an innate sense of justice. This is Fukuyama. So this, again, we're back to the sort of innate. Thymos is something that is innate. For Socrates, Thymos is an innately political virtue necessary for the survival of any political community. There's another quote. Thymos was in the end for Kojev a permanent part of human nature, right? There's my emphasis again. And this idea of, you know, the, the, per, the permanent unchanging, this is metaphysical, you know, the, 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 the thing that is the thing that it is. Uh, and uh, he's claiming this for Kojev. All right, now, uh, here's, here's another quote from Fukuyama. He says, is recognition not somehow related to the entire moral side of man's nature? The part of man that finds satisfaction in the sacrifice of the narrow concerns of the body for an objective principle or a principle that lies beyond the body, all right? Okay, yeah, this, the, the, this sort of rhetoric of, of natural man, man's nature, and thymos being, you know, a metaphysically, uh, metaphysical, you know, as ground in the human interior. It's all very, um, it's all very metaphysical. Um, and here's, so here's, let me, here, there's, Derrida pulls out, in this respect, Derrida pulls out a quote from, uh, you know, from Fukuyama to, to make the same point. Some like some of the quotes that I pulled out. So let me let me read this one. He says, "Here's Derrida citing Fukuyama. Kojev identified an important truth when he asserted that post-war America, or the members of the European Community, constituted the embodiment of Hegel's state of universal recognition." So here's what Derrida says: "Let us underscore the words important truth in in Fukuyama's rhetoric." They give a pretty good translation of the sophisticated naivete or the crude sophism that impels the movement of such a book and sets its tone. They also deprive it of any credibility. All right. So, 
you know, basically he's saying, you know, uh, Fukuyama is a kind of, this is a kind of a sophomore in the sense of, you know, the wise fool, precisely like the, uh, the, the figure that, uh, that, uh, that Socrates, you know, uh, well, in, in, in the story that Socrates tells of Thoth and famous or Amon Ra, that, uh, you know, that, that, that would be the product of, of, of a lot of, you know, reading who would only sort of appear to be wise, but would, but would be tiresome company because they would, uh, you know, they wouldn't really have a true, you know, wisdom uh, that within them. Uh, well, there he does not making a logocentric argument, but I think he is saying that this, this is, this is a work written by someone who's read a lot of books, uh, but it's kind of a sophomoric uh, juvenile uh, argument. So he's, he's, you know, he's, he's pulling age here perhaps on Fukuyama. Uh, but there's a lot of truth to what he's saying as well. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to uh, move to this other aspect. This, this is okay. This is a perhaps more important dimension of Derrida's critique of Fukuyama, is that he identifies this this rhetorical, we call sort of a sleight of hand rhetoric that's at work in Fukuyama's discourse. Um, and this is a kind of a, a sliding back and forth between what's going to call act, ideality and actuality. You'll get put it in terms of being and becoming, put it in, in more uh, meta, platonic metaphysical terms. Um, and so he's going to say this with respect to the um, concept of the democratic in, in Fukuyama, that in Fukuyama, the democratic will sometimes, when he uses the word the democratic or democracy, it sometimes appears as a, the ideal of the democratic and it sometimes appears as actual democracies on the ground. Uh, now, this is again, we talked about this in a previous lecture in terms of what we called a uh, zugma or solapsis, a kind of a literal figurative sliding back and forth in discourse. So he identifies this kind of rhetorical uh, effect or dimension at work in, in Fukuyama's discourse, which Fukuyama himself seems uh, oblivious to. But it's, again, it's kind of, it's kind of a slide of hand trick. You know, now you see it, now you don't. All right, so let, let's uh, read what, what Derrida says. He goes, on the one hand, Fukuyama's gospel of politico-economic liberalism needs the event of the good news that consists in what has putatively actually happened, what has happened in the last quarter of the century in particular. It cannot do without the recourse to the event that is to come, however. However, since on the other hand, actual history and so many other realities that have an empirical appearance contradict this advent of the perfect liberal democracy, one must at the same time oppose this perfection as simply a regulating and transhistorical ideal. Depending on how it works to his uh, advantage and serves his thesis, Fukuyama defines liberal democracy here as an actual reality and there as a simple ideal. The event is now the realization, now the heralding of the realization. Even as we take seriously the idea that a heralding sign or a promise constitutes an irreducible event, we must nevertheless guard against confusing these two types of events, as, as Fukuyama does. A thinking of the event is no doubt what is most lacking from such a discourse. Okay, so yeah, so I, th I think, yeah, I don't think there's any way to deny what Derrida is saying here, regardless of your whatever your politics are. I mean, Fukuyama, this is just as a matter of rhetoric, this is clearly something that he does. Okay, now we, we, we defined uh, solapsis and zugma before, but let's let's review this again, just so we're clear on what we're talking about, this literal figurative solapsis. It's, it's a, um, here, here's the definition that we looked at uh, previously when we were discussing Noam Chomsky's uh, linguistic theories. It is a formal trope which consists of taking one and the other word in two different senses, one of which is supposed to be the original or at least the literal meaning and the other the figurative or at least supposedly figurative reading. Okay, so uh, it's, a, it's also what, what we might call a catachrasis because, because if, if you keep doing it over and over again, you're going to produce meaning, but it's a violent production of, of meaning. So it's a very sort of crass rhetorical trope. Um, and we, we discussed this, like, just to review, and we were talking about Chomsky, like, for instance, we talked about the mind brain and Chomsky, the mind being, you know, an abstract, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, kind of like a figure, uh, not a literal brain, uh, but and the brain being the actual brain, how he'll bring them together and one word just collapse them in, into uh, these two 
like the abstract with the uh, actual. Um, and he does the same thing with the word grammar. Now here, here I'm quoting from an early text by Chomsky on the study of the English language. This is Chomsky's language. You can see there in quotes in the brackets. We use the word grammar to refer to both the, again, hypothetical system of rules represented in the mind of the speaker here and to the actual uh, theory the linguist constructs as a hypothesis. And then Chomsky says, no confusion should result from this. Well, it does result from it. And the same is true of, of uh, Fukuyama's rhetoric as well, is that he, when he says democracy, you have to stop and think, well, wait a minute, does he mean uh, France? Uh, does he mean, uh, you know, the, the, the ideal democratic state? So it's, it's, this, it's this constant slippage in his rhetoric. And Derrida rightly points this out. Okay, here's, here's Derrida again. Fukuyama considers the ideal of liberal democracy also as an event because it would have already happened because the ideal would have presented itself in its form as an ideal. This event would have already marked the end of a finite history. This ideal is at once infinite and finite. Infinite since it is distinguished from any determinate empirical reality, and it is nevertheless finite since it already happened, already as an ideal, and therefore history is over. So you know this this is a this is a, a valid you know deconstruction of, of Fukuyama's rhetoric. As for Fukuyama's sleight of hand trick between history and nature, actual and ideal, between historical empir empiricity and teleological transcendentality, between the supposed empirical reality of the event and the absolute ideality of the liberal telos, or the end, or the Hegelian you know, uh, end of history, it can only be undone on the basis of a new thinking or a new uh, experience of the event and of another logic of the phantomic, okay, a phantomatic. Okay, so we're gonna and so we're gonna see what Derrida does with this. He, he he's going to himself provide us with this new thinking in very explicit ways, and we'll look at what what he does uh, with this. Um, and it's not it's not that he's going to you know he says Fukuyama oscillates between the literal and the figurative, but that gap between the ideal and the actual is is in fact. Um, you know, it's it's always already present within uh, any kind of discourse on on the democratic, and so we're going to see what Derrida does with that, and and how he's not going to completely um, get out of that kind of uh, oscillation himself, but he's going to propose uh, an alternative to this kind of uh, celebratory triumphantism that we find in Fukuyama's uh, you know end of history and the last men. Okay, and so he, and so unlike you know Fukuyama, who says it's all history is all over, we've solved all of our problems. Derrida and Specters of Marx again. Remember, this was in 1993. Identifies you know what he calls ten plagues, a blackboard picture of plagues, like the problems. Right, and you can you know you have to read the text to get more deeply into each one of these. I'm just gonna, I'll just, I'm, I've really briefly, I just want to cover them quite quickly. Um, these are some of the reasons why he, you know he's gonna. It's not he's just trying to be pessimistic he sees these as real you know significant problems on uh, on the horizon that have to be solved in order to close the gap between you know the ideal of the democratic and its actual implementation uh, on the ground in real democracies um, uh, one is the question of unemployment two homelessness international deportations the status of the migrant the illegal uh, migrant um, three economic wars in Europe uh, U.S., Japan, the fighting of one another, market wars, uh, four basic contradictions in the idea of the free market itself. Number five, aggravations of foreign debt. Thinking here, for instance, of the IMF and the World Bank and how they function in, in Africa might be an, an instance of this. How is it that uh, after being colonized, African nations are the debtor nations to European nations? Uh, number six, arms industry and trafficking. Number seven, proliferation of nuclear weapons. Number eight, inter-ethnic wars. Number nine, phantom or mafioso states within states. Number ten, international law. Okay, now these are that's interesting. You know, you could we have to think about this in relation to where we are at this particular point in uh, in history. But these, but in '93, these were some of the problems that Derrida saw on the horizon. Of course, all of this was before. 9/11, uh, but 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 we're going to see 
that one of the most interesting aspects of the exchange between Derrida and Fukuyama is how they um, address the question of, of the Islamic world, what they say about the Islamic world, and what they say about you know, Israel as well, Israel and Palestine. And, uh, and, and, and here we find that, that, they, that, that much of what they see, say really does anticipate what is going to happen in the years to come. Okay, now here, now, so here's what Derrida, here's what, here is sort of his practice in terms of what he practically proposes uh, in opposition to this kind of, uh, this, this Hegelian uh, liberalism that is really a kind of a platonic Christian uh, logocentric Hegelian liberalism that, that uh, he's criticizing in Fukuyama. So he's gonna, Derrida is going to give his own, uh, you know, his own vision of what should happen now at this juncture in history. And these are some passages where we find him at his most sort of pragmatic. Uh, there are at least two ways to interpret what we have just called the blackboard picture, the 10 plagues. Between these two interpretations, how is one to choose? Why can we choose? Why can we not choose? Why must we not choose? In both cases, it is a matter of fidelity to a certain spirit of Marxism. Okay, and so uh, here's here's what he's going to call the, the what he's calling the first interpretation um, is, uh, is 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 somewhat similar to what uh, Fukuyama is doing, but he's 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 thinking it through in in Marxist terms. He says the first interpretation the most classical and paradoxical at the same time, would still remain within the idealistic logic or idealist logic of Fukuyama, but so as to draw other consequences, like going, you know, looking at it, for, for instance, as say a Hegelian Marxist might look at it. Uh, let us accept provisionally the hypothesis that all is going badly in the world today. Uh, is, is but the measure, but a measure of the gap between an empirically reality, an empirical reality and, an, and a regulating ideal, as does uh, Fukuyama. So, okay, so in other words, um, you know, that the, the problem with what's happening in the world today, what the, the, the aspects that aren't working, the, the questions that still need to be addressed, are a result of the gap between the ideal of the of the liberal democratic, democratic which Fukuyama is going to say cannot be improved upon, uh, and, and what's actually taking place. So in this sense, we would just sort of close the gap between between the two. Okay. So even, but he says even within this ideal hypo hypothesis, okay, if you were to go Fukuyama's path and you were to uh, say that that's all that that there's that's all we need to do is to close the gap you're still going to need recourse to a certain spirit of the Marxist critique. This is still going to remain urgent and will have to remain infinitely necessary in order to reduce the gap between the ideal and the actual, you know, as much as possible in order to adjust reality to the ideal in the course of a necessarily infinite process. Okay. So in other words, um, okay, let's say you say, yeah, the, 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 the ideal of the liberal democratic cannot be improved upon. Fukuyama is right about that. Let's say that's, that's how you feel. Then, okay, then let's, let's strive to uh, achieve that ideal. Let's, let's, you know, make, you know, uh, healthcare available to all. Uh, let's uh, make school affordable. Let's eliminate, you know, homelessness, poverty. Let's, let's fix our democracies by adjusting them to, to, to fit the, the ideal that we've already articulated. But if, even if we were to do that, Derrida is going to say Marxism is still going to be useful and fruitful for you uh, in, in, to, in, in doing that. Okay, now the second interpretation, he's going to say, this is where we're going to get into like, well, this, there's another way of thinking about this. You can think of it more, he's going to say essentially de deconstructively. Uh, the second interpretation of the blackboard picture would obey another logic. Beyond the facts, beyond the supposed empirical evidence, beyond all that is inadequate to the ideal, it would be a question of putting into question again, in certain of its essential predicates, the very concept of said ideal. Okay, now this, this is deconstruction. In other words, instead of just saying that we've achieved the most perfect ideal and that can't be improved upon, let's deconstruct the ideal and see if we can make it, you know, better. Now, this is deconstruction as in affirmation. And I mean, you think, for instance, of like, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the concept of, of, of man in, let's say, the founding of the United States. So 
we we hold these truths to be self-evident all men are created equal well we know that didn't mean it didn't mean you know black men and it didn't mean white women it didn't you know it didn't mean black women either obviously it meant a certain kind of man and so the deconstruction of the concept of man in that sense would be you know let's let's make the concept of man more authentically democratic and let's make it more authentically egalitarian that would be, you know, deconstruction of taking the ideal, but deconstructing it so that it can be improved upon. OK, so he's going to say, let's not just accept the, the liberal democratic ideal. Let, let's see if we can improve it by deconstructing it. That's another that's something else that we can do. And it would extend to the economic analysis of the market, the laws of capital, liberal uh, parliamentary democracy, modes of ref representation and suffrage, the determining content of human rights, women's and children's rights, the current concepts of equality, liberty, especially fraternity, the most problematic of all. And this is what he does in Politics of Friendship as he deconstructs the idea of fraternity in this sort of triage of liberty, equality, fraternity in Republican ideology. Dignity, the relations between man and citizen. It would also extend in the quasi totality of these concepts to the concept of the human, in other words, the deconstruction of the concept of the human, therefore the divine and the animal, and to a determined concept of the democratic that supposes it. Now, even in this last hypothesis, fidelity to the inheritance of a certain Marxist spirit would remain a duty. Okay, so this would be to take a more deconstructive path, and in doing so, uh, remaining true to a certain spirit of Marxist uh, thought. Uh, but if you notice in both cases, he's not proposing a, uh, you know, a return to, let's say, a socialist mode of production in the Soviet style. So, so to call him, you know, a, a sort of a postmodern Marxist here is, is, is problematic at best because it seems that one could criticize this for being, you know, uh, this position as being not sufficiently socialist for being really kind of staying you know in a certain sense within a uh within a, a liberal democratic framework but 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 applauding the idea of of, de of a deconstruction of concepts within that framework so that's that's hardly a revolutionary marxism and this is i think you know one of the reasons why many of his marxist critics were not that some of them weren't that enthusiastic about what he had to say because he's, he's clearly not uh, em embracing a kind of a Leninist Marxist, uh, you know, traditional way of thinking about Marxism. Anyway, he's just affirming, you know, the certain you know, aspects of, of Marxism without affirming Marxism itself. Okay. Okay. So here, here's, but here's what he says. He says, here are two different reasons to be faithful to a spirit of Marxism. They must not be added together, but intertwined. They must be implicated with each other in the course of a complex and constantly Reevaluated strategy. There will be no repolitization. Re there will be no politics otherwise. Without this strategy, each of these two reasons could lead back to the worse, to worse than bad, if one can put it that way, namely to sort of fatal idealism or abstract and uh, dogmatic eschatology in face of the world's evils. Okay, or evil. All right, so. Yeah, he's saying it's both. It's not one or the other, it's both. And we have to close the gap between the ideal of the liberal democratic and the actual de liberal democracies on the ground. But we also have to continue to deconstruct the concepts that we've inherited in order to make our, our, our democracies more, you know, um, perfect. Not, they're not finally perfect, but, but they can be perfected. Uh, they can be made better. All right. And that's that's what he's saying. This is not, you know, uh, let's have a revolution tomorrow. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> you know I mean, it, it, remember, Mar the Marxist world had just collapsed. So he's 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 uh, this is this is arguably a kind of a conservative. It's deconstructive, but it's also somewhat conservative as well in terms of how it's practically applied on the ground. OK. And here's his own in his own words. He says, what is certain is that I am not a Marxist. As someone said a long time ago, let us recall in a witticism reported by Engels, this is Marx himself said, je ne suis pas marxiste, I am not Marxist. Must we still cite Marx as an authority to say, I am not a Marxist? But what is the distinguishing trait of a Marxist statement? And who can still say, I am a Marxist? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, but for some out there, he's a post, Derrida is a postmodern Marxist. You know, I guess uh, what people don't 
say is actually significant. But if we look at Derrida's actual language, it's, it's only with a great amount of difficulty that we can describe him as Marxist. And I think as we get deeper into his deconstruction of Marx, we're going to see that perhaps we can call Derrida a Nietzschean, but it's you know very problematic to call him a, a Marxist in this sort of uh, you know garden variety way that people are banting about in the media. All right, so um, all right, uh, I'm gonna I want to turn now our attention, in the last part of this lecture to, uh, I think a very interesting aspect of this uh, debate uh, or, or this uh, or of Derrida's response to Fukuyama. Uh, and and it has to do with 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 material that that is very idiosyncratic to Derrida, and that is with his you know I remember in Derrida's own case he was a Jewish man from uh, Algeria who lived most of his adult life in in France, uh, but when he was very young as a child growing up in Algeria his whole family lost their French citizenship, and uh, this had a very deep impact on him and of course then you know he grew up in the in the, in the shadow of the, the holocaust or the show as, as we've already discussed and i think the question of the loss of citizenship that his family underwent may explain a little bit about derrida's commitments to zionism uh, because derrida was finally a, a, a zionist and there's no denying this fact so for instance he's going to say in the case of algeria where he grew up it, and, and he's going to argue for what he calls a disassociation of the political and the religious, but he never says anything like that in, in the case of uh, Israel. Uh, and so he, he, uh, he's going to take, we're going to find him here. It's very uh, cryptic, but, you know, in places, but we're going to find him taking exception to Fukuyama's, you know, Christian rhetoric, because, partly because Fukuyama's uh, liberal democratic critique of what's you know, happening in the world also implies a critique of Israel. And this is what Derrida doesn't like. And so he, he, he mixes this in to his argument. But I think if you're, uh, you know, if you're, if, if you, if you're uncomfortable with uh, Zionism, particularly in its, um, you know, promotion of, let's say, an, uh, uh, an ethnic uh, or religious, however you want to define Judaism as an ethnicity or as a matter of one's you know, religious beliefs, but a concept of the citizen that's not based in residency in a Kantian sense, but on one's uh, you know, uh, maternity or one's you know, religious beliefs, uh, that, that this makes, um, this, makes uh, this is going to run at, at, uh, foul or run at odds with Fukuyama's more you know, traditionally liberal democratic you know, articulation of the citizen as someone that dwells and is a resident in a particular place or town so let's let's look but let's look at the at the at the language of both figures and let's see how they how what, what how this debate kind of takes shape the, which is sort of secondary to this other this these bigger questions that we were just addressing in terms of the, the grand concepts in their theory but this is a very particular uh you know sort of uh watershed issue between the two and i don't think that derrida uh, uh i don't think he gets the best of fukuyama here in fact i think it's kind of some of some of the things that he says are, are might you might find surprising um so here's here's derrida what he calls the war for jerusalem and this war for Jerusalem, what he calls this appropriation of Jerusalem's war for the appropriation of Jerusalem, becomes a kind of an obsessive figure in his discourse. Uh, and so, and, and, and he's going to, and we'll, we'll come back to that when we talk about these specters in, 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 in the next lecture. But here's, uh, here's what he says. He says, the war for the appropriation of Jerusalem is today the world war. It is happening everywhere. It is the world. It is today the singular figure of the world's being out of joint. Now, still in too elliptical a fashion, let us say that in order to determine in its radical premises Middle Eastern violence as an unleashing of messianic eschatologies, uh, and here think of like Judaism, Christianity, Islam, each one of them is a messianic eschatology. Uh, in, in, in both Christianity and Islam, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus in both religions will come again at the end of the world. In Judaism, Jesus is not the Messiah, but there is a belief that, the, uh, that, the, that, that a Messiah will come at the end of time or the end of the world. So these, these eschatologies are, are teleologies, much in the same way that Kantian, Hegelian, 
Marxian thought offers teleologies as well. So as you can say, there's a kind of a violence that's taking place over these different messianisms, which again, remember, is different than messianicity, which is uh, it's this, this sort of giving credit to the other, which has nothing to do with what uh, he's describing here, which are these dogmatic messianisms, messianisms in which people are killing one another in the name of religions dogmatic religions, and as infinite combinatory possibilities of holy alliances. Marxism remains at once indispensable and structurally insufficient. It is still necessary, that is, but provided it be transformed and adapted to a new thinking of the ideological, as we just saw in, 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 that, uh, in, in what Derrida proposes as his own praxis in comparison to Fukuyama's. Okay, so um, here is Derrida reading this question of this figure uh, this, that, that haunts the discourse of Fukuyama. We're going to come back to this when we read about these questions of specters in, uh, in, 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 a, in a previous lecture. So I don't want to get too much into the question of these idioms that haunt the discourse of Fukuyama uh, today in this lecture. But, um, but let's, let's read what Derrida says here. He says, the Christian figure of the good news or gospel crosses the Jewish prefiguration of the promised land. Now we must not, we must be careful not to overinterpret, Derrida says, but let us take seriously the insistence of this rhetoric in Fukuyama's book. What does it seem to be saying to us? That the language of the promised land and thus of the land promised but refused to Moses is at least by itself better fitted to the materialism of physics and economics in Fukuyama's thought. Okay, so uh, again, you have to kind of stop, back up, unpack the language, what he's saying here. But, um, you know, what he's saying here is that, that um, you know, is that, that this Christian discourse of, that is this Hegelian Christian discourse is better suited uh, in, in terms of thinking about this war for Jerusalem uh, than is, let's say, a more, let's say, a Judeo-centric discourse. Uh, if one takes into, or, or let's say, a Judeo-Muslim Judeo thought as well, if one takes into account the fact that Fukuyama associates a certain Jewish discourse of the promised land with the powerless, now let's stop there for a minute. You know, why does he say, why does Derrida say a certain Jewish discourse of the promised land? He means Zionism. He's not going to say the Z word, but that's exactly what he's talking about. The, he, he's associating Zionism, uh, which, which Derrida is calling a certain Jewish discourse of the promised land with the powerlessness of economic materialism, which is to say Marxism, or of the rationalism of natural science. And if one takes into account the fact that Fukuyama associates, again, a certain Jewish discourse of the promised land with the powerlessness of economic materialism, Marxism, or of the rationalism of natural science. And if one takes into account that elsewhere, he, Fukuyama, treats as an almost negligible exception the fact that what he with equanimity calls the Islamic world does not enter into the general consensus that he says seems to be taking shape around uh, liberal democracy, one can form at least an hypothesis about the angle Fukuyama chooses to privilege the eschatological triangle of Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Now, it looks like in my typing, I, I repeated that discourse, but uh, the, the first part of that. But it's, I think it's worth uh, uh, looking at again. The, the, the certain Jewish discourse of the promised land is Zionism, which Fukuyama is associating with Marxism as both sort of equally disempowered, powerless a political rhetoric. So he's, it's 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 as if Derrida is trying to rally Marx, those who are Marxist, who think of themselves as Marxist, to see themselves as sort of wounded allies with Zionists in this discourse of Fukuyama's. It's kind of a it's kind of a strange. Uh, he's he's assuming that if you're Marxist, you're going to be sort of on the same page with him. Uh, in your uh, defense of, in your, in your feelings or defense, your views about Zionism, which, you know, which, which implies that Zionism itself would be impervious to deconstruction. Derrida does not, he never did deconstruct Zionism, clearly. Uh, and, um, um, you know, let, this was a task that, that later happened in, in, in the years that followed when, you know, for instance, when, uh, when Vitimo uh, 
and Michael Martyr put together this book, Deconstructing Zionism. There were many scholars, you know, like Zizak and Butler and so on, who, who did take up this task, but Derrida did not take up this task. He left Zionism, uh, you know, he sort of, he left it unscathed is one way of, of putting that. And here he's, he's, he's trying to get Marxists to, his Marxist audience to, to, to see those who are, you know, uh, Zionists as being equally wounded by this Christian discourse of Fukuyama's. Okay, now let's let's look now at what Fukuyama actually says about Judaism and, and Islam in the end of history and the last man. Let's look at Fukuyama's own language. Here's Fukuyama. He says, like nationalism, there is no inherent conflict between religion and liberal democracy, because of course religion is privatized, uh, except at the point where religion ceases to be tolerant or egalitarian. And we've already noted how Hegel believed that Christianity paved the way for the French Revolution by establishing the principle of equality of all men on the basis of their capacity for moral choice. A great majority of today's democracies have Christian religious heritages, Fukuyama says. In some ways, then, religion would appear to be not an obstacle, but a spur of democratization. All right, so that's interesting. So, what, but, but what, when he's calling here religion that's going to spur on greater, you know, dem better democracies is, is very clearly a Christian religion. It's not the same in Fukuyama's discourse with, with Islam and Christianity. And so now let's look and see what he says, like what these two religions do in contrast. And again, remember, this is true. You know, hey, you know, this is again why so many Hegelians love, you know, some of them are coming at it from overtly you know, Christian, uh, uh, you know, perspectives because the, the discourse of Hegel and Christianity can be very easily, uh, you know, synthesized. Okay, so here's uh, Fukuyama. Orthodox Judaism and fundamentalist Islam, by contrast, are total, total, excuse me, totalistic religions which seek to regulate every aspect of human life, both public and private, including the realm of politics. Okay, so uh, Orthodox Judaism, fundamentalist Islam are totalitarian religions, in effect. And they, uh, you know, in, in, insofar as every aspect of your existence they want to regulate. You know, how you brush your teeth, how, food that you eat. You know, there are there is no realm of the private in these articulations of the religious, as Fukuyama is going to argue. Um, these religions may be compatible with democracy. Uh, Islam, in particular, establishes no less than Christianity the principle of universal human equality. But they are very hard to reconcile with liberalism and the recognition of universal rights, particularly freedom of conscience or religion. Okay, I had said, you know, previously, like for instance, when I was living in, in Jordan, our last lecture, we were talking about Schmitz, the concept of the political, that many Muslims have no you know, problem with uh, the democratic. Is, Islam is an egalitarian you know, religion, as is Christianity. Uh, but this idea of liberalism is another question, and 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 Fukuyama is saying the same thing here. Um, and there are very complex reasons for this. Now I can't get into this in this debate today. It would require a whole in this uh, uh, lecture today. It would require a whole other uh, lecture. But I do, if you're interested in this question, the best text that I know on this that you can explore is Fatima Mernissi's uh, Islam and Democracy, in which she lays this out very clearly. It's a, it's a short little book, but it, and it's, she's a wonderful writer, uh, very gifted writer. And, and I think you can, if you're interested in that, again, it's called Islam and Democracy. It's by the Moroccan scholar Fatima Mernissi. And she goes into the reasons for this very, very clearly. Okay, here's Fukuyama. Islamic fundamentalism bears a more than superficial resemblance to European fascism. As in the case of European fascism, it is no surprise that the fundamentalist revival hit the most apparently modern countries the hardest, for it was they whose traditional cultures had been thoroughly threatened by the import of Western values. The strength of the Islamic revival can only be understood if one understands how deeply the dignity of Islamic society had been wounded in its double failure to maintain the coherence of its traditional society and to successfully assimilate, assimilate the techniques and values of the West. Okay, 
Um, now, this may seem a little stinging, this rhetoric, particularly if you're Muslim. But, you know, at the time, I remember in the, in the early 90s when this appeared, this was this was not this. You could hear the same argument throughout the Islamic world as well. And we think of we've already talked about uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the question of Fukuyama's argument about, you know, the motive, the humiliation being a motivation, like in the case of, say, 9-11, a possible you know, motivation for what uh, took place. But Fukuyama really wants to underscore this, 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 this is this deeply Hegelian theme of, of how we're driven by our desire to be recognized and have our dignity uh, recognized as well. And he sees this as being a problem uh, in the Islamic world that, has, that had not, uh, you know, been modernized to the extent that Western Europe had modernized. Okay. Fukuyama, many ostensibly liberal societies, I say, for instance, Israel, because ostensibly, of course, means that appear to be liberal, but are not liberal. And that's the case. That's a wonderful description of Israel because, it, uh, you know, they, many uh, like to claim that Israel is a liberal democracy. It's not, uh, but, it, but it can have the appearance of, of a liberal democracy. Uh, so many ostensibly liberal societies, for instance, Israel, were tarnished by an admixture of intolerant nationalism failing to universalize their concepts of rights by effectively basing citizenship on race or ethnic origin. Now, that's a key quote there. Let me read that last part again. Failing to universalize their concepts of rights by effectively basing citizenship on race or ethnic origin. Now, that's a perfect description of Israel even today, in which citizenship is, is not based on residency, but based on race or ethnic origin. Uh, being you know Jewish by birth, or it could be a matter of of one's you know religion. So this again, remember, there's a kind of a selectic, uh, there, there's a selepsis that goes on in the use of the term you know you know Judaism as well or Jewish. What does it mean to be a Jew in terms of you know it can be it can be your ethnic identity in the same way say that you're you're Jewish in the same way say that you're uh, you know Germanic, uh, or it could also mean um, you know your your spiritual beliefs. Many, I think the majority of Israeli citizens are Jewish, but are not particularly observant. Many are atheists. I think the majority are atheists. So, uh, but, 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 so it, it, it can slide. It depends on how you articulate it, but in neither case does it have to do with residency. And this is what Fukuyama is, is I think, rightly pointing out. Uh, it, okay. So here's Fukuyama again. Those who say that nationalism is too elemental and powerful a force for instance, Zionism or Jewish nationalism, to be bank vanquished by a combination of liberalism and economic self-interest should consider the fate of organized religion, the vehicle for recognition that immediately preceded nationalism. There was a time when religion played an all-powerful role in European politics, with Protestants and Catholics organizing themselves into political factions and squandering the wealth of Europe in uh, sectarian dogmatic wars, you know, stupid wars, people killing each other in the name of, you know, doctrinal differences, dogmatic wars, which is arguably what, you know, led to, and if you were kind, you say, well, this is what led to the Enlightenment. People wanted to stop doing this, these, uh, stop these idiotic wars. Uh, contrary to those who at the time believed that religion was a necessary and permanent feature of the political landscape, Liberalism vanquished religion in Europe. After a centuries-long confrontation with liberalism, religion was taught to be tolerant. Today, the idea that the practice of religions other than one's own should injure one's own faith, that we're talking about in the context of the West, seems bizarre, even to the most pious churchmen. Religion thus has been relegated to the sphere of private life, nationalism can be defanged and modernized like religion. Okay, so note there, uh, you know, nationalism and religion both need to be defanged in Fukuyama's uh, reading, uh, and that's that's a that's a pretty interesting argument. All right, now let's look. Let's see what he says specifically about uh, Zionism, and he, you know, I mean, look. It, it's, it's kind of interesting to me because, you know, Fukuyama as a neocon, he's kind of at odds with himself here because a lot of these neocons will support because there are these, you know, the, 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 like if you're a political realist, a neocon is not the same thing as a political realist. But and Fukuyama does uh, criticize political realism, uh, 
uh, to his credit. Uh, but uh, political realism, you know, has uh, ha ha those who are political realists, again, as I said, have traditionally sided, you know, with uh, have, have liked this idea of Israel being this sort of exceptional state that has, enjoys this, you know, particular kind of status essentially as a 51st state in American uh, foreign policy. And, you know, Israelis themselves criticize how, like, if you look at the shape of Israel, like some people call, well, the United States has turned Israel into a, like one of those Air Force, you know, carriers that, that, that fly around the Pacific, the planes just kind of land and cut, come and go on it, you know. Uh, and, and some people have, you know, Israelis themselves are not, many Israelis themselves are not, you know, particularly happy uh, about this. Um, but but if you're, but the political realist, you know, is going to say, well, we got, you know, Israel, we have, it doesn't matter what their ideology is there. We have to, uh, uh, they have to be on, you know, the side of, of the American, you know, of, of America because they've got the most powerful uh, military force. So here, but here we find, this is interesting, is that neocon Fukuyama is criticizing uh you know, by implication, it, it, that is his argument criticizes Zionism. Although he's kind of cowardly, I, I have to say, unfortunately, because he doesn't. He's not. He puts it in a footnote, and he doesn't particularly. You know, he he doesn't go straight after. Uh, you know, this question, but he 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 kind of dances around it. But there's no way of evading what the implications of his argument are, and Derrida doesn't like this. So it's it's so here we find, it's it's strange. And here we find the the uh, the neocon. Uh, Fukuyama being, you know, more uh, progressive than the so-called Marxist uh, Derrida, at least on this particular question. Okay, um, so here's uh, Fukuyama: broad acceptance of the principle of national self-determination, not necessarily formal self-determination. Groups to live independently in their traditional homeland had made it very hard for anyone to make military intervention or territorial aggrandizement stick. You know, end of imperialism. The power of third world nationalism has been almost universally triumphant, seemingly regardless of relative levels of technology. So There's these decolonizing movements that started, you know, in the late 50s and up into the 70s. The French were driven out of Vietnam and Algeria, the United States out of Vietnam, the Soviets out of Afghanistan, the Libyans out of Chad, the Vietnamese out of Cambodia, and so forth and so on. Uh, but then he says there are, and this is, this is where he puts this in the footnote, there are, however, or there are, of course, several important exceptions to the rule, such as the Chinese occupation of Tibet, the Israeli, now note there, here's the key phrase that, that sets Derrida's alarm bells ringing, the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, and the Indian absorption of Goa. All right, so uh, there, there you have it. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of interesting that you see this, this kind of difference emerges between them. And we have to ask ourselves, who here is the true sort of, you know, progressive? And remember, Derrida does describe, you know, what he's doing as, as linked to the, the question of the progressive anyway. He doesn't, he doesn't renounce the word progressive. All right. Now let's go back. I read this quote in a previous, you know, uh, lecture on um, Schmidt. I, I said that we would come back to it. And so let's come back to it now. Because remember, uh, Ziv Sternhell is a uh, Israeli who's criticizing the this the, the zionism for the same reasons that fukuyama is but he's doing it from the perspective of an insider and he's uh, someone who who is an israeli and has a lot invested in this question and is is a, is a champion of, of liberalism here uh, so here's sternhill liberalism derives from the initial attempt in the 17th century to separate religion from politics a liberal state can only be a secular state a state in which the concept of citizenship not religious identity lies at the center of collective existence. Kant and other Enlightenment philosophers believe that the only free and open society is one that recognizes the independence of reason and the autonomy of the individual. Reason determines the frontiers of knowledge, and reason, not religion, forms the basis of moral and political decisions in a, in a liberal democratic society. In, in such a society, uh, human will is the source of morality, and the only laws one must obey are those created by human beings, not God. Thus, a state cannot be liberal as long as religion plays a major role in governing uh, society and politics. Okay, and there again, I place below this this definition of citizen, which is a resident who of a town or a city. Um, you know, a cité, as in you know, from the French. 
And this is what uh, Sternhill is saying, you know, Israel, and this is a problem that, you know, Israel has never been able, the Israelis have never been able to answer. Well, what, what is Israel? Is it, you know, is it going to be a liberal democratic society, you know, in which all citizens, wherever their religion or ethnicity have, you know, an equal say, an equal voice in the democratic process, or is it going to be an exclusive ethnic um, democracy in which some people are granted rights and others aren't on the basis of either their, you know, however you articulate it, their religious or ethnic identity. Still a problem in Israel today. We find Derrida here being sort of, as, as a Jewish man um, with a particular history, again, where he lost his own citizenship, his family had, you know, Derrida, I, I don't think that, you know, that there's nothing to be gained by pretending that Derrida was not a Zionist. He was a Zionist in the same way we could say that Heidegger's thought is in some sense compromised by his connections to, uh, you know, to, to, to fascism. And, uh, you know, this is, this is, this can't be evaded. And so I think, you know, in some ways Derrida gets the better of Fukuyama in this debate, but uh, in other ways uh, we find that, you know, there being aspects of Derrida's critique of Fukuyama that are, I find at least myself to be problematic. Okay. So in closing, here's some questions for further consideration as we get deeper into Derrida's reading of Marx and in the, into the text of Spectres of Marx. If Fukuyama's quasi-religious, as if religious discourse is haunted by certain obsessions, as we're going to see in the next lecture, figures of speech, ide resu, or received ideas, idioms, idiocies, uh, even, how is this not true of Derrida's discourse? For instance, his, uh, again, rather obsessive reference to the figure of Jerusalem, which he obsesses over, but also messianicity, messianism, the Abrahamic, and so on. And Derrida himself, you know, acknowledges that his own discourse, it's not just Fukuyama's discourse that's haunted, it's his discourse, and in fact, every discourse. Uh, furthermore, why does Derrida feel compelled to defend Zionism or Jewish nationalism in the face of Fukuyama's critique? Uh, we might want to compare, for instance, his argument for a disassociation of the political and religious in Algeria, the land of his birth, but why not Israel too? And so um, this will bring an end to our lecture. And in the next lecture, we're going to go deeper into Derrida's reading of Hamlet, not just for literary considerations, but it's out, we're going to see that it's out of that reading of Hamlet that he's going to articulate a, a very particular kind of politics that I think you'll find to be very interesting.